In this video, we combine some of the most disturbing cave diving tragedies we've covered on this channel so far. From divers who got lost in the silt to divers who made a wrong turn and struggled to find their way out. If you enjoy watching these videos, make sure to subscribe to our channel for more exciting cave diving stories like these. In 2011, Bonnie Cotier went for an exploration in the Pusakum Cave Complex. Bonnie was a passionate cave diver who left nothing undone until it satisfied her professional taste. If you were seeking a professional cave explorer, Bonnie Cotier would have been one of the best options available. However, she got into trouble when exploring a Welsh underwater cave complex, as we will see in this story. You may not be prevented from entering the Pool Akum Cave Complex, but Mother Nature already has an access control that discourages most visitors, unless you are a seasoned cave explorer. Pulakum Cave Complex is located in Clitic Gorge near Gilwern, Wales. The cave complex has different tall avens which are linked by tight rifts and low muddy crawls. An aven is a vertical pillar that rises from a cave tunnel and occasionally connects to passageways above. Cave divers visit the cave less frequently because it's located far from the extreme, has muddy and tight passages, and is made up of sharp rocks. Here's a fact about this cave that will shock you. Have you been in a cave whose entrance can only be seen when you are right beside it? You can be sure the restrictions that will be within such a cave will be greater than the ones you encountered at the entrance. This is true of the Pulakum Cave Complex, where the entrance is located under the rock on a small grass ledge. The entrance tube is just the size of a human body and it leads directly to the top of the first pitch. You have to go through the bottom of the first pitch to enter the first aven. This has a passage that can be followed back under the pitch, which is at the entrance heading to the surface of the cave. The way to the second aven, which is seven feet, two meters from the ground, is through a rift with a tight squeeze. Then you will make a 33 foot, 10 meter crawl to get to a ledge 16 feet 5 meters above the floor of the third aven. Then you will go through another ledge to the left and climb down 16 feet 5 meters with a knotted rope to enter the fourth aven, which is large and impressive. As you progress through the aven, you will encounter a lot of sticky mud. Afterward, you can then proceed to the fifth and sixth aven through many hurdles. Bonnie Cotier, a 52-year-old American native of Washington, D.C., was a creative director and instructor who has worked with different businesses and agencies in Washington. She graduated from the University of Maryland after her college days at Hawthorne School. Bonnie Cotier was married to Steve Francis Huben, who is also a cave explorer. They both lived in St. Nudes, Cambridgeshire. She moved together with her family to different countries, which included Germany, Tampa, Florida, and the United Kingdom in June 2009. Though many couples have different passions and they pursue them separately, the case of Bonnie and Steve was different. Both partners had a lot in common, and they both shared their passion for diving. They both went for cave diving training and were qualified for international cave diving. They both had journeyed to France, Mexico, and the United States for diving adventures. It's more enjoyable to have your partner dive with you. However, Steve was absent on the last adventure Bonnie embarked on. The reason for his unavoidable absence was that he had some commitments at work. He didn't only love diving, but the journey to and from cave sites was always pleasurable for him. They both began scuba diving in 1999 and later moved to cave diving. Because of Steve's work at RAF Molesworth, they both moved to Huntingdonshire. Bonnie was also a member of the Huntingdonshire-based Inspired Group. This is a group dedicated to motivating people who are venturing into their businesses. She was always full of life and commanded the respect of everyone around her. Any opportunity people had to talk with her, they were always grateful for the amazing words she spoke to them. She was honest and straight-talking. Bonnie was a renowned member of the cave diving community and also had her own design company, Golden Dog Corporate Communications. 
She was both a member and great supporter of a networking group for Cambridge-based businesses, Cam Creative. Bonnie was always friends with everyone she met, and her life inspired people around her. On April 23, 2011, Bonnie Cotier went for a dive at the Pula Coom Complex with Martin Farr, a Welsh diving instructor who was not just a professional diving instructor, but also had many years of experience, as he had been diving for over 40 years. He met Bonnie, a fellow diver, at a meeting in Yorkshire and made arrangements for himself and Bonnie to accompany Duncan Price on his diving research at the Pula Coom Caves. His aim in diving was to take photos of a restricted part of the cave, which is located about 49 feet 15 meters away from the entrance. In this cave, a guideline was placed 82 feet 25 meters into the cave to prevent inexperienced divers from diving farther into the cave because it was dangerous. The air cylinders of these three divers had enough air for them to dive for 45 minutes. When they began diving, they were going according to the laid down plan. Martin and Bonnie, who were standing close to the entrance, helped as photography assistants to take the required photographs by Duncan in the restricted part of the cave, which was the purpose of the visit. Duncan, engrossed in the research and cave mapping, dove further, leaving behind Martin and Bonnie. At the entrance restricted site, Martin attached another guideline to the permanent guideline for Bonnie to be able to go through the restriction and enjoy her dive around the cave, as it was her first time in this cave. 45 minutes into the dive, Bonnie was not yet at the surface. This became a concern to Martin, who quickly rushed into the cave, not minding that he was running low on air. Getting into the cave, he found Bonnie alive at a short distance from the main guideline. He quickly caught her by the harness and drew her forward. Suddenly, Bonnie broke away from his hand and headed in the wrong direction. Martin hurriedly returned to the surface to call for the assistance of his diving partner to help him bring air from his house, which was 6 miles 10 kilometers away from the cave complex. Also, emergency services were called in addition to the air he requested. On getting back, Duncan dove into the cave again in search of Bonnie. But unfortunately, when he found her body, it was hanging vertically in the water. Her two 7-liter air cylinders were empty when they checked, and she was no longer wearing her regulator in her mouth. Though there was a diving line around her waist, it could have been cut by Bonnie to free herself. There might have been a possible entanglement that would have hindered her from returning to the entrance. Bonnie Cotier's death was confirmed by Dr. Grant Evans, a pathologist, to be a result of drowning. You might be thinking that she went too far. However, Bonnie, who had been qualified for international cave diving, didn't dive beyond her capabilities, only that the cave was new to her. She was an experienced cave diver who did not need a connecting guideline with her diving partners, which was a required standard of international diving practice. What could have caused the death of an experienced cave diver in a new cave? It wasn't the malfunctioning of any of her equipment, nor was it injuries. It must have been that she lost her way to the exit of the cave since she wasn't familiar with the cave. It is clear that she missed her way, but what could have made a professional miss the guideline inside the cave that eventually cost her life? After much struggle to find her way, coupled with running out of air, she drowned and died. This wasn't new to cave divers, who are always on a risky adventure exploring caves, both new and those they are used to. Cave divers have mainly two options while diving, either to come out safely or die in the pursuit of their dreams. But they wouldn't allow this fear to stop them. Bonnie Cotier will be deeply missed by her best diving partner and loving husband, Steve Francis Huben. They had both shared diving passions together, traveling to various countries for different diving adventures. She will forever be remembered for her activeness and passion for so many things, aside from cave exploration.
On November 14, 2018, at about 10.30 a.m., a team of two German divers reported as Team 1 entered Cenote Kalimba, where they met three other teams reported as Teams 2, 3, and 4, who wanted to dive into the same site. Cenote Kalimba is part of the Sistema Sakaktun, a cave system in Mexico which was ranked as the longest underground river and the second largest cave in the world. It's a very popular cave system in Mexico. The length of Sistema Sakaktun Cave is about 229 miles, and it has the maximum depth of about 394 feet. The cave system flows into the Caribbean Sea. Sistema Sakatun has hundreds of cenotes that make up the whole cave system. Among the several cenotes that make up the Sistema Sakatun is Cenote Kalimba. It's located on the way to Coba and about 8 kilometers from Tulum. The cave is not too deep, with an average depth of about 33 feet. According to Mexican standards, Cenote Kalimba has a moderate flow. It flows towards the southeastern region into Gran Cenote. Both the German divers of Team 1 were quite experienced cave divers. One of them received his full cave diving certificate in 2012. He had been to Mexico several times to dive. He had about 150 to 200 dives of cave experience. The second diver in Team 1 also received a full cave diving certificate in 2015, although this was his second trip to Mexico. Team 2 and 3 planned their dive towards Box Chen. That meant when they got to the T-junction, which is just a few minutes of diving into the cave, they would take the left turn, and their first jump would be to the left side. Team 4, on the other hand, planned to do the bypass towards Cenote Pabalani. They would jump to the right when they go beyond the BOA restriction, and also turn right when they get to the T-junction. The dive plan and cause of the incident of Team 1 will be discussed later in full detail. They started their dive with each team following their dive plan. Team 1 entered the cave system and clipped their stage tank on a line at the left side at about 15 minutes dive time. A stage tank is an extension tank used by divers during their exit. So Team 1 left their stage for use during their exit. After about an hour that Team 1 went into the cave system, Team 2 started their dive. While Team 2 was diving, they saw the stage tanks which Team 1 had clipped on the line. They also saw the cookies that marked the exit to Kalimba at the first T-junction. They left the spot and continued their journey towards Box Chen. But they noticed that there were no other markers or any jumps installed. Team 2 finished their dive and surfaced, but discovered that Team 1 had not surfaced at Kalimba as it was planned. One member of Team 2 went to check for them at Grand Cenote, thinking that perhaps they'd changed their dive plan to exit at an entrance other than Kalimba. When he got to Grand Cenote, he couldn't find the Team 1 divers, so he returned to Kalimba. They might have surfaced there in the meantime, as they were possibly initially delayed. When he got back to the Cenote Kalimba, he discovered that the situation was still the same. At that point, he knew something had gone wrong. He rushed down to a local dive shop to inform them that there were two missing divers in the cave system. It was now 2.30 p.m., about four hours after Team 1 had started their dive, which raised the alarm that they were missing divers. Jeff Clark, a diver who was at the local shop, was the first to arrive at Kalimba to confirm the news he heard. After confirming the news, he went to call on other divers. Fortunately, he was able to find Kim Davidson and Johan Isaacson, who came with their dive gear from Mayan Blue, another cenote in Tulum. The divers, Jeff, Kim, Johan, and Paul, and other locals who gathered at the site, already knew that the case would be a body recovery if the missing divers had not surfaced at another cenote. Robbie Schmittner walked down to four different cenotes to confirm if they had surfaced in any of them. He went to Pabalani, Box Chen, O'Toole, and Grand Cenote. At all these four cenotes together with Kalimba, they were not found. While Robbie went, they made arrangements for the search to begin. The four divers separated themselves into two teams. Johan and Kim were in search team A, and Jeff and Pal were in search team B. The two teams were ready to begin the search, but had a little challenge due to the fact that they didn't know the dive plan of the missing divers. 
Unfortunately, the other three teams that were with them in the morning knew that the lithium sunset section of the cave was part of their dive plan. And coupled with the fact that Team 4 met the first T-junction marked, though there were no other markers on the way to the right side where Team 4 dived. These reports became the guide for the search divers to work with. Search Team A was tasked with searching the main line towards Grand Cenote for any jumps that might be present. If they couldn't see any sign that they were there, they would search through Grand Cenote and Hotul. Search Team B would go right at the T-junction and dive to the Lithium Sunset section where they assumed that the missing divers planned their dive. So from the lithium sunset section, they would dive till they got to the main line that was coming from the left side of the T-junction. At about 5.30 p.m., Search Team A entered the cave, and after about 15 minutes, Search Team B also entered. Just 15 minutes into the dive, they found the missing divers' stage tanks clipped to the main line. They continued the dive plan, and at the T-junction, they found one of the missing divers' cookies marking the exit side towards Kalimba. At the T-junction, search team A went left, going towards the main line. They got to the circuit, the Much's maze, and the lithium sunset section, but no markers were found. They continued diving and searching. Close to the guideline, they saw one of the missing divers' portable lights on the cave floor. This was a sign that the missing divers could probably be seen along this path. When search team A got to the jump at Paso de la Garto, which was about 50 minutes into the dive, they found the body of one of the missing divers. He was found between Kalimba and Grand Cenote main lines. He was going towards the Grand Cenote main line. The two main lines were not connected by any installed jump, so search team A connected the jump to continue diving towards Cenote Hotul. They were going towards Cenote Hotul because they found a double arrow that marked the way to the closest exit. The body of the second missing diver was found between Grand Cenote Main Line and the Kuzan Na section. That was about 55 minutes of dive time. Search Team A confirmed the death and location of these two missing divers. Having found the body of the two missing divers, Search Team A exited the cave through Cenote Kalimba because they only intended searching for the bodies. The recovery was to take place the following morning. They met with the authorities that were already waiting for them at the surface to plan for the recovery of the two bodies. Search Team A spent about two hours in the search operation. The following morning, the recovery operation for the bodies of the two divers was completed. A team of three divers entered the water through Cenote Hotul to recover these bodies, and in less than an hour, they brought the bodies to the surface. The recovery had no complications, and proper documentation was made by the recovery team. The two missing divers took a camera when they were going into the cave. They intended to take the records of their dive with the camera. From the video they had shot, the dive plan and activities of these two divers were discovered. The two divers had entered through Kalimba. They planned a single-stage video dive. They filmed all the activities going on throughout their dive. Both divers were alternating between the roles of cameraman and subject. They filmed some short videos of the passages they passed through. The video showed that the two divers dropped their stage tank on the main line along the first T-junction. From the video, it shows that they spent 28 minutes to get to the place where they clipped their stage tanks, instead of spending about 15 to 20 minutes at normal dive pace. This delay in pace could have been because of their videography activities. Using cameras during dives normally affects a lot of things, including dive pace. They continued into the cave through Kalimba's main line till they got to the first T-junction, where they clipped the markers found when Team 4 was returning. They went to the box Chen jump into Paso de Lagarto. From that point, they made a jump and then continued left to Much's maze. The line they were following ended with another jump. From there, they went back to the Paso de Lagarto line. They turned their dive close to the gap from Paso de Lagarto to the Grand Cenote main line. When their equipment was analyzed, there was no signs of malfunctioning from the equipment. The cause of the accident couldn't be figured out from their diving equipment. The regulators and tanks were functioning properly when they were tested after the incident. They were both with their line markers, safety equipment like wet notes, line cutters, and backup lights, among others. After all, they were both experienced and certified divers. 
so they knew the necessary equipment to go in with. From their recovered wet notes, there were some messages written in German that revealed their intended destination. What brought about these divers' deaths became matters of contemplation. The navigational error that was initially reported as the cause was ruled out based on the messages discovered in their wet notes, and their dive log confirmed their total dive time too. Their equipment did not appear to be malfunctioning, so that was also ruled out. It could have been that they both consciously changed their exit towards Grand Cenote. This was evident from the time between the last recorded video and the time they died. The passage of time was too short for any navigational error to occur. The fatalities could have been the result of their failure to obey proper gas planning. Videography could have also contributed to their accident. Their attention might have been carried away by the video so much that they didn't even know they were running out of air. The time they discovered they were low on air was too late for them to hold on towards their planned exit where they had their stage tanks. And due to this, they sought out the nearest exit. However, they were not able to make it to the exit, and they both drowned. The next story of this marathon is a tragic incident involving a diver who went to recover the body of another diver who had been dead in the sinkhole for 10 years. It was quite unfortunate that the promise he made to the victim's parents to recover their son's body brought himself into big trouble. Busman's Kraft, also known as Bushman's Hole, is a deep submerged freshwater sinkhole in the northern Cape province of South Africa. It's believed that Mike Rathborn, who was then an amateur diver, was the first diver who explored the Bushman's Hole in 1977. It's seen as a very challenging dive because of its altitude, which is more than 4,921 feet. This means that the decompression time will be equal to the time spent when diving at 1,112 feet below sea level. Several divers have dived deep into the Bushman's Hole, among them Ferne van Schaik, a female diver. She had the deepest dive, reaching a depth of 725 feet on November 24, 2004. In 1993, Eben Leyden reached a depth of 197 feet, but became unconscious and was brought back to the surface by a diving buddy. He didn't survive the accident. In 1994, Nuno Gomes led a diving team for dive training in preparation for the technical diving they planned to do in the week that followed. Dion Dreyer was invited for this dive. By then, Dion was a 20-year-old recreational scuba diver from South Africa. He was raised in Vereniging, which is some distance away from Johannesburg, by his father Theo Dreyer and mother Marie Dreyer. He was an adventurer, and some of the things he was passionate about were diving, hunting, motorcycling, and racing a souped-up car. Bushman's Hole is a fascinating sinkhole that draws the attention of every youngster that has a flair for adventure, just like Dion. With only two years of cave diving experience, Dion received an invitation to join the South African Cave Diving Association as a support diver at Bushman's Hole. He accepted the offer honorably, as that was his passion, and he was ready to go for it. They set out for the training on December 17, 1994, at the Bushman's Hole. As they made their dives into the deep water, everyone was enjoying their dives, until something went wrong with one of them. It was Dion. He had gotten to a depth of about 164 feet from the surface while ascending. The other divers noticed that his light was fading from their sight. Dion was sinking back into the abyss. They tried to rescue him, but before they could lay hold of him, he had gone too far. His diving buddies assumed that he might have lost consciousness. When diving to such extreme depths, the partial pressure of the oxygen rises to such a level that it becomes toxic to the central nervous system, also known as oxygen toxicity or oxygen poisoning. It can cause various symptoms, such as breathing difficulties, dizziness, and seizures. Dion might have suffered from oxygen toxicity. Nobody fully grasps the mystery behind Dion's sinking. But some locals believe that there used to be a particular serpent that fed on humans inside this sinkhole. However, it was believed that what could have caused his death was something other than the so-called serpent. Dion might have breathed too heavily, resulting in carbon dioxide building up in his lungs, which later made him unconscious. Dion had his last dive in the Bushman's Hole. It was a tragic moment for everyone, 
as his body was lost in the water. However, two weeks after his death, Dion's father, in his grief, hired a small remotely operated sub used by the De Beers Mining Company. A devastated father tried to get the body of his son out of the cold water. Unfortunately, only Dion's dive helmet was found right on the center floor. His body was not seen. After this attempt at Dion's body recovery, no one was able to recover his body from the Bushman's hole. Some would say, soldiers go, soldiers come, but barracks remain. That was exactly the right word for the Bushman's hole. Many divers died within the cave, yet many people are still intrigued by the extreme depths of Bushman's hole, pushing themselves beyond the limit. Years rolled in and out. It was now about 10 years since Dion died in the Bushman's hole. Everyone has almost forgotten about Dion Dreyer, whose body was yet to be recovered from the Bushman's hole. But the plaque his father placed on a rock at the Bushman's Hole kept reminding those that got to this site that Dion's body remains in this sinkhole. In October 2004, Dave Shaw dove down the Bushman's Hole. Dave Shaw was an Australian scuba diver, technical diver, and airline pilot for Cathay Pacific since 1989. Before he started flying for Cathay Pacific, he had flown for the Missionary Aviation Fellowship in Papua New Guinea and Tanzania. He had also flown agricultural aircraft in New South Wales and South Australia. He was a passionate and very amiable man. He was devoted to the course of his career until his death. Dave's goal of the Bushman's hole dive was to push the limit and set a new record. He reached about 900 feet. He spent a few minutes exploring the bottom of the sinkhole. It was an amazing experience for him. Though he experienced some symptoms of narcosis at a depth of 800 feet, he was yet to push through. When he got to about 876 feet, he saw the floor of the sinkhole for the first time. And while exploring the newly discovered world in Bushman's Hole, he stumbled on something. It was a dead body lying underground on his back. It was the body of Dion Dreyer who had dived into the cave 10 years before. His mask was still in place, but some of his body parts no longer had a fleshy covering. Dave was not able to look too closely at his body because it was already hidden in the mud. He was unable to recover the body on that attempt. Dave returned to the surface after a 10-hour dive and told Dion's parents, Theo and Marie, that he had found their son's body. This was unbelievable for the couple at first, but Dave assured them he would return to recover the body from the Bushman's hole. Dave and Don Shirley, another diver, went for the recovery operation. It was the deepest underwater recovery in history. The two divers made a complex dive plan for the recovery, but they need up to nine divers to make the dive. They were worried about recovering a body that must have remained almost a skeleton, and the body could have fallen apart. So they decided to go with a bag to carry Dion's body. The recovery team prepared for the operation. They had all the equipment ready. Dave and Don were acquainted with most of the equipment they were about to use, save the helmet camera that Dave wanted to use. It was a new camera, and he had never used one before. The recovery team all gathered at Bushman's Hole two days before the final dive. They were all given their specific roles, and Dave was to go and get the body from the depths where it was lying. Dave instructed the team openly to be careful and not risk their own lives for the sake of getting a body out of the sinkhole, in case anything went wrong during the dive. However, Dave and Don had a private agreement to signal with their flashlight in case they needed each other's help in the deep. Dave dove to a depth of 886 feet, the place where he had earlier found the body of Dion. He was supposed to place the body into the bag and take it to a depth of 725 feet, where Don would be waiting to help bring it to the surface with a decompression of about 10 hours. The people at the surface were waiting for them but they could see no sign of anyone from the recovery team coming out with Dion's body. So von Skyk knew that something had gone differently from the planned dive, which had caused such a delay. But the exact situation that happened was still unknown to them, so they kept waiting. Don, who was waiting for Dave at a depth of 725 feet, also became concerned when Dave wasn't showing up. He noticed that no bubbles were coming from around the place where Dave had dived. By now, bubbles were supposed to have been coming from the ascent of Dave, but there was nothing. Then he saw a dim light, far off, but it wasn't moving. 
They thought Dave might have been faced with serious narcosis because of the depth he had gone. Narcosis affects one's thinking ability, so when in such a condition, you need to be fully focused to get your mind to think and solve whatever challenges you are facing down there. After waiting for some time, Don decided to descend to the depth where Dave had dived to see what was happening and how he could help. When he got to about 800 feet, he heard a very loud sound. It was Don's regulator controller that burst. He had to turn from finding his friend to saving his own life. Don had to control his air supply manually as he tried returning to the support divers that were above him. So they managed to get back to the surface. Then Don told them that Dave couldn't make it back to the surface. Don almost died in there too. He was left with about eight hours of decompression and eventually permanent damage that impaired his balance. Dave's death was a great agony for them, but they consoled themselves. The police divers later went back to Bushman's Hole to recover all the equipment and dive lines that were left after the failed recovery operation. While they did this, they saw the bodies of Dion and Dave float up from the base of the sinkhole. They were wedged in a crevice very close to the surface. That was a great surprise to the whole dive team. They assumed they might have dived past it earlier without noticing it. Von Skyke said that Dave had fulfilled his promise of bringing Dion's body back to the surface, as they saw that Dion's body was below Dave Shaw's body. Eagle's Nest Sinkhole is known for its stunning views and extreme depths. It's regarded as one of the world's most impressive cave dive sites. However, this cave is also very dangerous, as it has claimed numerous lives. Please subscribe to our channel for more exciting cave diving stories. Eagle's Nest Sinkhole is located within the Chazahowiska Wildlife Management Area in West Central Florida, and it has an amazing underwater cave system. If you judge this sinkhole by its surface outlook, you would never think such a beautiful world exists inside this sinkhole. The sinkhole is one of the few beautiful sinkholes with an unattractive surface area and a rugged entrance and passages. You can call it a dangerous beauty. Of course, it is beautiful within, yet it can be dangerous right inside the cave too. What are those discouraging things at the surface of this sinkhole? At the surface, the water has a greenish color, like a pond filled with algae. It's dark and difficult to see through, unlike the nearby Buford Springs and Wikiwachi, which have crystal clear waters. It's just as though it's the home for alligators, mosquitoes, and ticks. Even with all these discouraging sights on the surface, there are a handful of professional divers who have made their way into the underwater cave systems. To them, the eagle's nest is indeed a paradise. It's an admirable, top-notch underwater cave system. The visibility in this sinkhole depends greatly on the present situation, that is, the condition of the Florida aquifer and the prevailing amount of rainfall. At the Eagle's Nest sinkhole is a message board that shows different diving conditions encountered by divers who have previously dove there. Unlimited visibility and diving by braille with zero visibility are the major conditions stated on the message board. Many times when you get to this sinkhole, you'll discover that it's been covered with tannin. Tannin is a natural organic coloring dye. It makes the water turn darker than usual. In some favorable conditions, the water can sometimes be gin clear. When you dare to enter it, it's like you are in a different world entirely. It's fascinating, magnificent, and risky all at the same time. Eagle's Nest Sinkhole is only advisable for those who are qualified and experienced because it's a dreadful cave diving site. Another caution you need to take is finding your way within the cave system. You can easily miss your way. It's a vicious and unappeasable sinkhole. Though it's recommended for professional divers alone, such divers must still receive information from people who have dove there before, or even have them as guides, so that they can be aware of the likely situation of things to face within the cave. When entering the Eagle's Nest cave systems, you have to squeeze yourself into the tight, narrow, 70-foot long passages. Oftentimes, there are many challenges to entering with your diving gear. There are large caverns that are described with magnificent names such as Ballroom, Super Room, and The Pit. 
The cave system is astounding, but because of the extreme risk associated with exploring it, many amateur and unqualified divers have lost their lives in this cave. On September 11, 2005, Judy Bedard and her longtime boyfriend Rudy Banks were set for the dive adventure to the fascinating cave systems of Eagle's Nest Sinkhole. Judy Bedard was a 48-year-old cave diver. She was a diver with a difference and had several diving adventures with her friends in the past. Judy was a certified diver. She was also a registered nurse who worked at Tampa General Hospital and lived in Tampa, Florida. Judy and Rudy entered the water at 4.30 p.m. After a few minutes, they began the dive. When entering Eagle's Nest, what awaits below the surface of the Eagle's Nest is a stunning world-class underwater cave system. It consists of a labyrinth descending 300 feet below the Earth's surface. The intricate network of pathways extends for over a mile and is so amazing that it can be unsafe. The cave system has a downstream tunnel with plenty of rooms that are at least 300 feet deep. And there is also a stretch of the cavern between two of the rooms in this tunnel called the Pit. It's called the pit because the tunnel dips to 300 feet. Judy and Rudy had just begun their dive, taking a slightly slow descent into the cave. Judy was using an oxygen-only tank until she reached 30 feet. She switched to her nitrox tank at this depth. That's a mixture of oxygen and nitrogen. She needed to switch because diving requires different mixes of gas at different depths. The dive was going smoothly until they got to a depth of 130 feet. She began to have some difficulties. Her equipment began to develop some technical problems. At this depth, she switched to her Trimix tank, a primary tank, which contained a mixture of oxygen, nitrogen, and helium. This primary tank is the one needed for the depth she had just reached. But unfortunately, the primary tank didn't contain the right proportion of these three gases. Seeing the situation, Banks said Judy switched back to her nitrox tank. Because of this, both divers began to ascend back to the surface. Ascending in cave diving is supposed to be a progressive process and not a quick process in order to avoid decompression sickness, which is also called bends. Fast decompression can also cause gas embolism. Embolism is when blood circulation is obstructed due to the presence of bubbles or a blood clot in the bloodstream. At this point, time is not on their side to embark on a slow decompression. Because of the mistake in her primary tank mixes, Judy had been breathing more helium than necessary and almost zero oxygen. By the time they reached 100 feet, Judy had become unconscious. However, her breath seized when they got to 60 feet away from the surface. At this point, Rudy wasn't sure of what option to choose. Judy is dying, and they're still 60 feet away from the surface. If he takes a fast ascent, it'll aggravate Judy's traumatic condition because her body was already deficient in oxygen. If he takes a slow ascent, Judy will eventually die due to lack of oxygen. The former is preferable. She has hope of getting over the decompression sickness rather than dying right within the cave. So Rudy took a very fast ascent and up at the surface, he brought her out. Now he needed help resuscitating Judy. Who would be of help? Greg Stanton, a former diving safety officer at Florida State University, and his friend James Gary, a member of the University of South Florida's Diving Control Board, came to help Rudy after returning from their dives. Greg reported that it is quite unfortunate that it was the ascent that began a kaleidoscope of challenges and the injuries under which she now struggles. She also had arterial gas embolisms. When she reached the surface, Judy did not have any pulse. Her eyes were open and blood and foam were coming out of her mouth. James stopped Dan Pelland, a Spring Hill resident who was coming to Eagle's Nest for some photographs. Using Pelland's phone, James called 911. Pelland helped Rudy carry out CPR on Judy. Because of the state Judy was in, CPR, or cardiopulmonary resuscitation, was needed at this point. It's a medical technique used to revive someone whose heart has stopped beating, a life-saving emergency technique. Judy's heart came back to life 15 to 20 minutes after they began CPR. Her breathing was restored with CPR, but she was yet to regain consciousness. She needed urgent medical attention, but help was not readily available at the moment. 
The major limitations to getting recovery help at the Eagle's Nest sinkhole are the fact that it's located in a remote area and that it has an unpaved entrance. Though the roads are improved, they are still somewhat rough. They are still left with large potholes, and it's very difficult to get help at this site in case of an accident. As regards the case of Judy, inadequacy in supplies and transportation challenges greatly affected the response from the medical team. They had to rush the victim with a sport utility vehicle on a backboard without an IV drip. The ambulance and helicopter were waiting at the edge of the forest to take Judy to the hospital. Stephen Farmer, a fish and wildlife investigator, made three statements regarding the reasons Judy became badly injured at the cave site, agreeing with the words of Greg and James, saying, Her trimixed tanks had poorly mixed gases. There was a poor analysis of the proportion of gases in her tanks. The isolation valve, which is attached to the manifold that connects the two tanks, was left closed, and she didn't check it to ensure it was open. Some professionals said that Judy was responsible for her equipment. All divers must check their breathing gases before starting their dive. Had she tested the isolation valve, she would have noticed that the tanks were not evenly pressured and probably wouldn't have led to further problems, leading to her canceling the dive. Rudy was unhappy all through that period and was unable to get comfortable because of Judy's health. Judy was flown to Shans and her status was classified as serious. In the first few weeks, expectations for recovery were very low. The doctors were amazed at Judy's survival for the first 24 hours after the dive. Her kidneys failed, and she experienced multiple heart attacks after being taken out of a hyperbaric chamber to treat the air embolisms. Hyperbaric oxygen therapy is an effective method carried out to increase the rate at which gas bubbles are removed by the lungs. Friends and other divers who know Judy as vibrant find it to be a difficult reality. She was a cheerful person who was fun to be around. It was unfortunate that such a fate befell her. Judy was transported to Tampa General Hospital where she began to rehab. Her full consciousness didn't return until November, two months after the incident. Judy said, I remember waking up. I couldn't move. My legs had atrophied. I had on a tracheostomy tube. I thought, Oh my God. During her time in the hospital, Judy had suffered from cardiac arrest, respiratory failure, multiple organ complications, cognitive erosion, and post-traumatic amnesia. Usually, a patient who suffered so much trauma would most likely survive with neurological damage, physical limitations in the arms and legs, and potentially paralysis. When she started, Judy required assistance getting into and out of bed. She struggled to maintain her equilibrium. She was out of breath after approximately 10 steps, even with the aid of a walker with wheels. She underwent months of intense therapy. After around five weeks, she was able to walk more than 300 feet. She had a fortunate life story, and one of her doctors described her recovery as miraculous. Also, her former physical therapist on the brain injury team at the rehabilitation center said, for what she had, it was one of the best outcomes I've ever seen. Judy had outpatient therapy for an additional six months after being discharged from the hospital in January 2006. She spent that time regaining her strength, flexibility, and coordination. The next summer, Judy accomplished something that had previously seemed unimaginable. She went with Rudy, now her husband, on an open water dive in the Gulf of Mexico, right off the coast of Newport Ritchie. As she laid in bed during the months of her rehabilitation, she had been dreaming of it. In June 2007, she went back to work at Tampa General as an operating room nurse, but she eventually made the decision to go to the medical records division. Judy wanted to spend more time diving and didn't want to put in a lot of overtime. Judy resumed her exploration of underwater caverns after shaking off some rust and a load of anxieties. Several places, including Peacock Springs in North Florida, have been attempted by her. Emergence du Rissel, a beautiful and very famous cave diving site in France. 
Many European divers came here to take classes and explore the cave. However, in 2021, two fatal incidents occurred in this cave, which we will cover in this video. Emergence du Russel, or Russel Cave, is located in marciac sur sele Occitanie region of France's Lot province. France is one of the best places in the world for cave diving, with over 20,000 caves known to exist. Around the rivers of Lot and Dordogne, in the southwest, is one of the most fascinating areas. Many of the long, deep caves found here have water that is mainly clean and warm, resulting in excellent diving conditions. The visibility often varies between 15 to 100 feet, and the water's average temperature is 14 degrees Celsius. The Lot is a real cave diving hotspot in Europe, containing more than 25 cave diving sites in the area. The area is popular for European divers who take cave classes there so they don't have to travel to Mexico or Florida. The Russell Cave is one of the most famous caves in the area, with over 5,000 divers visiting each year. It's located along the Sele River, which is a tributary of the Lot River. You go into the water via a staircase, which is made of boulders. To get to the entrance, you'll need to swim 114 feet in the Sele River. After a large, wide passage, the cave splits into two passages, one tunnel with an average depth of about 32 feet, and a second with an average depth of about 64 feet, running in the same direction. The shallow tunnel is beautifully carved by erosion, and a sort of bubble-like surface with many craters provides a lunar-like site for novice cave divers. After about 360 meters, the two passages meet again. After this point, the cave takes a few jumps into the depth, also called Puy by the French. One is at a depth of 150 feet, which is suitable for novice cave divers. The other jump is only for the more experienced cave divers because of the depth of 262 feet. Russell Cave is an archaeological site with one of the most extensive records of prehistoric cultures. Archaeologists discovered many artifacts reflecting over 10,000 years of use in a single location in the 1950s. In 1968, the Russell was first dived by two divers from the Spelio Club Auvergnat. Debras and Martin reached 492 feet. The line's greatest depth was 100 feet, and it wasn't until 1973 that it was expanded to 984 feet. In 1975, Fentoli and Tolomduan descended to Pit 4 and reached a depth of 147 feet. Over time, more exploration took place, particularly in the early 1980s, when Joachim Hassemeyer inserted his knife into a rock and attached his line to a depth of 3,609 feet into the system. This knife is still there. Olivier Isler was the first to traverse Sump 1 on August 12, 1990. Ten hours, 35 minutes were spent diving back and forth in all. Lucky Slayer marks the conclusion of Siphon 1, after which you can move on to the following siphons. Russell is made up of five sumps, Siphon 1 being the longest and deepest. The deep part starts in Pit 4 and can only be completed using Trimix mixes. Rick Stanton, Martin Farr, and Jason Mallison, among other gentlemen, explored the deeper sumps in the years that followed. The conclusion of Sump 5 was reached in 1999. The main line is 14,485 feet long in total. Unfortunately, situations occur frequently. Today, we will cover two of the three incidents that happened in 2021 in the Russell Cave. At the start of May 2021, Robert Kozbeck, a Polish cave diver, arrived in France. He uploaded a photo on his Facebook profile along with the caption, We are starting the full cave diver course. He planned to perform a solo dive on May 8, 2021, which was his 53rd birthday back then. Robert was an experienced diver since he was diving since 1987, and he was an instructor in scuba diving. Robert owned the Bork Company since 2007, aided disabled people, and was an associate member of the Nautica Underwater Tourism Center Association, working with teaching disabled divers in the HAS system, which is the Handicap Scuba Association system. He wrote research publications on the activity of methodology for disabled persons who practice diving and diving for disabled people. Robert had dived in caves numerous times, and the diving exploration of one of Europe's most difficult caverns was a tremendous adventure and a massive challenge for him. 
he still wanted to teach and progress as a diver. Aside from diving, he had a master's degree in physical education and taught swimming and first aid classes. He had been a lifeguard and he served in the 56th Combat Helicopter Regiment and was a non-commissioned officer in the Polish Army and he was also a paratrooper. Shortly before this birthday dive, he was part of a TDI cave instructor training course with some other Polish instructors, which was happening in France. The TDI cave instructor course is a course few cave divers will get into because of the course prerequisites. Cave divers who want to follow this course, for example, should have performed over 200 cave dives and have certification for TDI introductory cave instructor and be certified as an open water instructor for at least two years. This shows that Robert was a very experienced cave diver. For this dive, Robert planned to spend about three hours to cover a total length of 8,202 feet, which he also posted on Facebook on the day of the incident, along with some technical information about his equipment he was planning to use. On Saturday at 4.30 p.m., Robert found himself in a difficult situation when he was just starting to dive. Other practitioners were present around him, it happened at the start of the adventure, when he was not yet at a depth of 32 feet. Other divers, including Swiss, French, and German divers, had to pull him out of the water. He was immediately brought out of the water and given a heart massage before being attended to by paramedics who were rushed to the spot. When the incident occurred, an experienced instructor was supervising a field trip. She was the one who gave Robert a heart massage while waiting for aid. The firefighters then took over the scene. Because of the CPR, cardiorespiratory activity was restored. Robert was taken to a hospital in Kaur. He was still unconscious and in critical condition. Three days after the incident, Robert passed away in the hospital. It's unknown whether the accident was caused by a technical issue or a heart condition. French authorities probed the causes of the fatality. One of the commentators stated that Robert might have died as a result of hypoxia induced by the closed ADV. According to his former CCR instructor, Robert lacked the knowledge, skills, and experience needed to safely perform the dive that he had planned. He had not completed the cave instructor course we talked about earlier. At the time of the incident, Robert was qualified to perform single-stage CCR diving without DPV, Diver Propulsion Vehicle, in open water with air diluent, minimum oxygen 21% or greater. Robert broke all standards and went beyond the scope of his training. For the dive Robert planned, he should have gotten at least CCR Trimix, CCR Cave, and DPV Cave qualifications. The second incident took place on October 7, 2021. On a Thursday afternoon at 12.30 p.m., a 39-year-old Belgian cave diver went for a dive into the Russell Cave. He was together with three other members of a Belgian caving club. It was the first time this group was going to dive into Russell Cave. The Belgian diver went into the cave for exploration, and after descending for 32 feet and about 65 feet from the entrance to the resurgence, he became trapped in a narrow passage. This was the same passage which was given special attention during their research, planning, and briefing because they were wondering if the Belgian diver would fit through the narrow passage. It was reported that the diver tried to squeeze through the restriction in the cave, became stuck, and it caused his rebreather's counter lungs to compress and empty. According to them, his hands and arms were extended ahead of him, or otherwise in a position that he could not reach the control valves of the rebreather or his bailout. Because he didn't get back to the surface, his teammates came to retrieve him and notified the emergency services. Unfortunately, his teammates were not able to get him loose, and he eventually died of cardiac arrest. They mentioned that if the counter lungs had not compressed and controls were accessible, that there would have been enough breathable gas for approximately five hours at the depth the deceased was stuck, which could have potentially been more than enough time for a rescue to have been carried out instead of a recovery. It took the fire department's rescue team approximately 45 minutes to free the deceased Belgian diver. In vain, they tried to revive him. However, their intervention came to a close shortly after 5 p.m. The sub-prefect arrived, as did the gendarme of Livernon Fijac and the mayor of the town Jean-Paul Mignat. It was the third diving accident of 2021 and the second fatal one. This was the second cave diving disaster marathon. 
Let us know what you think in the comments section. If you enjoyed watching, take a dive on the like and subscribe buttons and hit the bell icon so you get notified when we come back with another exciting cave diving story.